typically you are around 50% of the melting temperature. So in this process, you don't want to melt unless specific cases that I actually will talk about. Uh, but you want just to have a promotion of diffusion phenomena. And that temperature, 50, 60 percent, is the temperature where you actually activate and uh, accelerated this phenomena and reach the, the temperature. Because if you reach melting temperature, you lose the, the geometry that you produce, and you don't want that. <laughs> and uh, coming back, yeah, during sintering, we have this evolution where uh, the initial part looks like a sweet chill, where we have our material and a lot of porosity inside the dark top here. With the notification, the particle uh, bonding and become more like a unified structure. Even at the end, we typically have some residual spore, even if it's uh, uh, very limited. So we have these four structure change, but also microstructure because we have also the in some cases the, the grain rows. So you can see these kind of uh, structure here are the grains that also at a certain point they start to increase their dimension. And because of this, we have also mechanical and physical properties of our component material uh, change. But here in this presentation, I'm focused more on what happened at the dimensional uh, part. So when we study the uh, variation of the dimension of our component, there are some uh, specific phenomena. One is the anisotropy. So our parts change the dimension not in the same way in all the direction, but we have some direction that have more shrinkage than others. So I, in specific application, I study where this phenomena can derive. And the second part is the influence of the gravity. Uh, this is very important for objects produced by additive manufacturing because we want to produce maybe something complex that you have very overhand parts. So these overhand parts uh, during the dissipation, they might have some distortion because of the gravity. So our model is uh, we used to try to predict this phenomena, try to understand where it's coming from, and try uh, in this part to also provide some guidelines to what can be done to avoid this, uh, this phenomenon at this design level. So first, um, the first phenomenon, the anisotropy. So in this part, I'm focusing on the net shaping uh, process. So we just briefly describe what is the net shaping. Uh, I will show what the powder structure due to that process look like because it will be very important to understand uh, how this powder looks like after the net shaping because that will have a lot of uh, influences on the symptom behavior of our material. And here I will describe the study domain I created to uh, simplify the powder structure to describe how I can embed this information in a mathematical model that can um, predict the zinkage rates and provide me information on what, how this phenomena evolved during the system. So here you, I will describe the model that derived from this. And we see some uh, experimental validation of the model and their project to obtain. So, for net shaping, uh, typically we consider the compaction of powder in a dye. So, we fill a dye with the powder, we compact it, you eject it, and when you paint this part, you put in a furnace to be sintered. So this type of technology is very used to produce mechanical components that need to have 
very precise dimension. But you have also noticed that these parts show an anisotropy behavior. And this anisotropy behavior is still like under studies, not completely fully uh, understood as phenomenon. So how it means for uh, anisotropy is like, if I produce this here, for example, with this process, once and have this specific dimension radial and high, when I center, so have this shrinkage, what happen? The difference in dimension that we have here, the shrinkage that is here in the right direction, in the right direction, are different. So something happened, and what we can obtain as information is how the compaction process modify the powder structure and result in that different shrinkage during the thing. So if we analyze the material after compaction, so these are our powder particle, and this uh, vertical direction is the direction where we apply the pressure. We can see how these particles looks like, are not spherical, but looks like more flat and pancakes. And we can also notice that we have non-uniform particle packings. We have a different extension of the contact region between the particles. And also the pores have a sort of flattened um, shape. And uh, for syndrome, we know that the shape of the pores is very important because the surface tension and the curvature of radio of this pore uh, are promoting the uh, syndrome stress that is the driving force for uh, phenomena of densification. So all these parameters we define as geometrical activity because we define how the structure of our material, the geometry of our material, influence the uh, diffusion phenomena. On the other hand, here and here and here, we had deformation, classical deformation localized. And it's probably different from the different direction. So this localized plastic deformation can activate you, specifically at the beginning and the early stages of the diffusion, some specific diffusion mechanism that is defined as diff uh, dislocation pipe diffusion. So when we deform our material, we introduce defects, and these defects are dislocation, and has been studied how these uh, defects have to increase the diffusion of our uh, material from uh, the inside of the particle to here, here where we have the pore. So this uh, part, this kind of texture master, microstructure that obtained due to the compaction, uh, we define as structure activity. So when we have to model the sintering to consider the anisotropy, we take into account these two activities. So how we can uh, embed these two contribution in a mathematical model, so for the geometrical activity where we have this uh, flattened uh, porous material morphology, we, yeah. So you have here the dislocation of contact between classified as a geometrical activity. And then you have localized plastic, which determines whether it's a localized plastic deformation over an extension. So they, they look awfully similar. And they actually derive by the right? Yeah. And so they 
They derive by the same reason. Um, all of these derive because we are applying a uh, compaction that is mainly in one direction. So once we are looking at this extension, and you will see when I uh, describe the model, we consider how this flattened particle, this flattened uh, force, and also the contact region influence uh, the diffusion, uh, yeah, the sintering. Uh, but at the microstructural level, this is not enough to uh, understand how this um, anisotropy happened. Uh, also, because with the evolution of the microstructure of this geometry, we see the force tend to be spherical at the end of the sintering. Uh, because they tend to reach a sort of equilibrium and the spherical shape is at equilibrium and that slows down the, the densification. As well, the, the contact extension um, can keep some difference between the two directions until you can actually analyze because at a certain point you, you kind of lose the, the track of the, of the contact. Um, the localized plastic deformation is also a transient effect because you know you center, you heat up, and you reach like close to the sintering uh, temperature. The defect that you have introduced here, you know, you have recrystallization, annihilation of defect, so it kind of decreases. So you have to consider all these interconnect phenomena that have a very impact at the beginning, but this different of anisotropy is developed at the beginning of the process and after it then don't get recovered. So possible to prepare to inference that all of the localized that information or a potential extension by the sense of the stress is the stress what defines that or is it is really more of a Exponential process, or you define it based on what you think is class mm -hmm. information versus. Uh, I'm not, I'm not, maybe yeah, yeah. for my question to yeah. present the model. Okay. Uh, yeah, because um, uh, the sequence stress, you know, it depends on the job. What is the final uh, driving force typically for pre sintering? Uh, so we are not applying any external pressure during the sintering. Is there a nearly how the stress is localized here at the junction between particles and the pores. So, and plus, larger is the contact between the particles, is more, you know, the flow is like a flow of liquid, more space have and more material can flow in that area. In a narrow space, the flow is more limited, so you have an amount of uh, material that is limited. The plastic deformation uh, in the dislocation pipe diffusion, you have to imagine that the, these dislocations are kind of piled up. They tend to pile up here where you have the deformed area. And it looks like uh, on highway for the atoms because they have more space to pass through and diffuse from here to here. So you have to consider both of these two, two factors in the, in the model. So is it correct to say that plastic deformation is something that happens within a grain? The contract region is just two grains that touch here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, they, they look the same in the picture, but I think you're talking about different. This is but def, plastic deformation is the river versus the stream, right? It happens within the grain. Yeah, so <laughs> here and here. Probably we have had, and I we really try to measure with different techniques. The dislocation that we have here and here, and we found differences uh, because of the different strain that were subjected to these specific areas of the pipe. So it's one of the model validation that we use in this in this work. Yeah. I would expect that interaction at the intergranular region mm -hmm. to each. Somewhat dependent on composition. So now we are talking about powders. 
So in this work, I you, even in the picture, so the picture that I use is uh, iron copper alloy. So you see this particular uh, iron and this is copper, there is some carbon. Uh, but the model was tested on pure iron powder. So we was a homogeneous uh, composition. Uh, if you have metals with different phases, maybe the different phases have different, you know, some different mechanical properties and might that influence the uh, the strain. So for remove this unknown, we use pure metals. So at least we can re re reduce some uh, parameters that we have to take in account. But yeah, that was a good, good test. So yeah, coming back and hopefully we answer some more clearly some of the questions I received. Um, when I try to uh, model the geometrical activity, I base on the continuous mechanic of uh, sintering that take into account sintering stress and viscosity of material. And in these models, they consider the geometry of the packing of the particles and also the geometry of the board. So these type of models can help us to describe these activities during the sintering. For the structure activities, so consider how our crystalline structure of how our material has been deformed during the compaction. And this uh, as an obviously I look at the classical theory that are present in the physical metallurgy that describe this sintering as a diffusion of phenomena, so the diffusion mechanism. But using the classical volume diffusion, grain volume diffusion, those doesn't uh, distinguish the direction where these phenomena happen. It's just a function of the temperature. I mean, so for that, I consider, I try to embed this uh, texture of, uh, of the material and how the difference of, in this case, this location density can help us to describe this anisotropy of uh, dimensional change during sintering. So how I can describe our uh, domain? So here there is a simplified version of that microstructure here in 2D, in 3D, but after I move to 2D. So we can imagine that this little cube uh, represents a portion of those particles. And in between, we have this um, elliptical uh, shape that is our port. And here and here represent the contact region between the particles that have been deformed by the compaction. So considering that in uh, X and Zeta have a um, symmetrical case, so I can just cap our domain in that plane, plane that pass through the middle of the port and describe our problem into where I have the four uh, particles, I have the elliptical force, and here I can describe the contact area between these uh, particles. So here, uh, obviously, I can describe the geometry. A is the extension of the contact. On the x-axis, A, P, and C, P are the radius of the ellipse, and C is the other radius of the, the particle. Because of sintering stress and because of the shape of the pores, uh, the contact region, I have a localized stress created at uh, sigma x and sigma y that derived by the uh, theory of sintering. So, uh, so I just keep that description, but there are articles that describe why they have that specific shape and why they derived from the uh, radio curvature of that part of that port. And here and here, I have that different area where I have the diffusion flow. And I can describe this delta x and delta y. That is how much 
the two particles tends to approach to each other due to the removal of these atoms that get injected in the pore to kind of round it and close it. So looking at uh, the different works, I you can correlate the flux of diffusion due to the uh, volume diffusion in this case with the uh, chemical activity uh, mode. And this chemical activity can be related to the two stresses uh, developed at the interparticle uh, region. So, um, and it's describing that article uh, written by uh, Johnson. <clears throat> but also, we, as I mentioned, we can correlate the volume diffusion as due to the contribution, at least, that derived from the dislocation density. Again, uh, developed by Hart, he developed this uh, formula for the diffusion coefficient, where he considered the diffusion coefficient to be the lattice, but also considered the uh, contribution that derived from the dislocation density that we have in the material. So here we can modify the diffusion coefficient considering the presence of these uh, dislocations. And due to, again, the uh, continuum mechanics of sintering, we can correlate this uh, flux of diffusion with the evolution or the approaching of the particles along the, uh, respect to the time. And this uh, the evolution of this delta y and delta x represents, considering also the geometry of the particles, the two shrinkage rates in the two directions. So combining all of these little pieces of this puzzle, we ended up with these a uh, two formulation for the shrinkage rate along the two direction, considering the contribution due to this um, deformed microstructure, because we have the influence of the diffusion coefficient, and the contribution due to this geometry of particles and force. Since we have here the curvature, the radii of the particle force and the uh, curvature of radii. Uh, okay. 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 Beside the the hydrogen angle too. So how we can or where we can get beside all these uh, constants that can get from the literature, you know the material, so you uh, can get this information. But there are some parts of this equation that we need to measure from our material. Uh, specifically for the shrinkage rate, we can get it from the dilatometry test. So the dilatometry test, for, I don't know if everyone knows, we heat the material in a system with a probe that detects how much it will expand the contract. In our case, we have shrinkage solid contract. So we can derive the shrinkage in base of the temperature, but also in function of the time. So from that, we can get these uh, shrinkage rate. For the other parameter that we can uh, derive is the dimension. Yeah. So, so the only temperature dependence is in the T term? There's none of the other variables are actually temperature dependent? Um, the, this delta V and delta P uh, is the diffusion coefficient is factor of the temperature. Okay, that okay. Yeah, I, again, there, there is also the graph where I bought it. Uh, and the dislocation density. The dislocation density will be our parameter to validate the model. Okay. So we so this uh, I was talking to this okay. one. So this we get from the dilatometer. All the geometry part we will get from the CIM and images analysis. So we, for the different cases, different temperature treated, we can, using the images software, 
analyze all these parameters. So the only unknown parameters that are the two dislocation bands. So we actually not use this equation to derive directly this at the beginning, but we used to derive these two values that after we um, we try to validate measuring these two values in uh, experimentally with different approach because they sometimes they, they find the find the dissolution that it could be trivial. Um, yeah, and these are the model uh, validation parameters. So for the shrinkage rate, uh, what we did is taking a simple component like a bar uh, that have been only actually a core compactor and we cut it to produce a dilatometry specimen that were aligned in a specific direction. So in this case, aligned to the direction of the compaction and the plane. And we conduct some uh, dilatometry tests. So, for example, here, um, there is some information. So we heated up uh, using this uh, temperature rate and we keep it this, temperature, this different temperature for roughly an hour. And we notice that the shrinkage that we obtain along this direction was always greater than the shrinkage that we obtain for the specimen along the other direction. So here there is one of the plot I obtained for this uh, direction here. So here's how it looks like. And from this isothermal holding, we obtain the shrinkage. So these are the typical sample plot that we obtain from this <laughs> test that we have here. Sorry, this yeah. might be a very simple question, but why do you even expect a shrinkage in the orthogonal direction? I mean, thinking of a normal mm -hmm. uh, Material you compress yes. and it will expand in the other direction, right? So what, what is making it shrink? Yeah, because it's in a dive. So in the other direction, oh, it is it's confined. Okay. So, but the pressure that you apply in this direction with respect to the other two direction is is higher uh, because right. the other two direction gets split. So it's direct that, that, and you can notice from also those microstructural images because. Typical shape that you have, even if sometimes it's irregular, but typical shape for metallic powder are the spherical. So if you get like more concave, means that in one direction have been deformed more than in the other two directions. Right. So this shrinkage takes place while you still have that when the actual pressure being applied, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, so uh since I didn't have time, but I in this work I analyze with also the autonomy, same type of components of these uh, Sharpie bars that were produced with different type of pressure from I don't know 50 megapascal, 60, 70, 100. And with the increasing of the pressure, the shrinkage that I achieved was even larger. Function of the pressure. And I analyze also parts that were produced by cold isostatic pressing. That in that case, you apply uh, a pressure isostatically, so it's the same pressure in all the directions. And in those uh, components, there is no anisotropy. So the dilatometry curve are independent from the direction. So that means that there's something happened because we are applying our own axial uh, pressure. So, when you apply the axial pressure, yeah. to compact it. The, the geometry of the bar mm -hmm. make a huge difference in the field of hypothesis. Because you, know, you have a confined yeah. die, and then you're applying the axial pressure, yeah. and then you have all these voids. Yeah. So, while you really are applying the pressure and you're trying to fill the void, and then you're getting a, a non uniform distribution of the pressure or the stress on the two sides. Yeah. And that's why it makes sense that when you have an isostatic state of stress, when you apply the pressure from all the sides, mm -hmm. you actually don't get an isostatic. So that 
it, 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 my point is, is that, and I start to then is based on how you contact and engage with your audience, not the and I start to be driven by the technology. The technology. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah, yeah. It's because we are only actually compact the these parts. Uh, but the the only actual compaction is the most broad technology to produce this type of component. The cold isostatic pressing is is used maybe to produce pipe or something. is very is used more in labs than uh, in an industry. So an isotropy is actually a very uh, important problem for companies that work like in powder metallurgy because you you have to draw your your die and those dies cost 100 200 k up and if you draw that whole of that die in a brown way and you paint the component that doesn't uh, met the requirement for your mechanical component you have wasted those money you have to recreate a new dice. If you are lucky, you you have just to refine and make it larger. But you get larger, you need something smaller. You have to build an, a new one and are uh, 100, 200, or 300k that you just wasted. So it's a it's a huge problem. Understand how the process influence uh, your final part. So, I think you said I think it's the initial design of the die. Generate a specific state of stress or well, metric state of stress that would guarantee that you negate the anisotropy. Yeah. So that's where the, I guess, yeah. the money goes. Uh, yeah, or you you know the based on the process, based on the die, you can say, okay, I know that I have that much uh, shrinkage in this direction doesn't match the shrinkage direction, so I have to kind of uh, produce my die a little bit more deformed the initial shape that kind of compensate the different string page that I have to obtain the the part that I want. So yeah, yeah you get the point. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so here is how we get uh, the string page rate. But how we can get the, the geometry, uh, the most easiest way is use um, Taking picture of our material and use some uh, image analysis software and try to uh, get information from that. So obviously, in a real material, <laughs> obtain something like this is now possible. So all the content might be some twisted. Also, the force you see, you have some horizontal, some some are are like more vertical. Uh, so what we try to do is like, okay, we measure roughly this length and we kind of uh, consider the contribution of this length along the two directions based on the how much was inclined. So to consider. Similar we did with the course. So we could measure, we simplify the shape of the course. So, you know, it, it are not elliptical, but we consider to create these ellipses that are inscribed in the port, and we measure the two ready. And also in this case, we uh, consider how this ready can be uh, correlated with a ready that is actually horizontal or vertical using just a trigonometrical relationship, just to have an estimation. So, from that, what we obtain with some uh, the average value here for the interparticle lengths, so the uh, this A and C for uh, the different cases at different temperature, we see the evolution. So the average the length for A, so this contact here are greater than the contact of C, and both of them grow with the temperature. That makes sense because, the, you know, the, with the densification, also the, part, the particle after the grain tends to grow, and so you have also the uh, growth of the contact with them. Yeah, it's not a problem. Interesting, so I think contact Okay. Audience probably say, <laughs> Don't invite that game. Um, 
So we said that the one way to find out the geometrical changes mm -hmm. is so who has the end and single so but, but what can actually do this with finite elements? Because we're talking about deformation, we're not talking about any anything else. So what you can do, one can maybe do is assume a it's different geometries of the particles mm -hmm. and then assemble three or four of them, then apply a stress and keep track of information. Mm -hmm. And then and then you will get a very nice idea of what is the change in the geometry of functional applied force. Yeah. Without yeah. resulting to immediate yeah. So this uh my this micro mechanical model that we do we actually didn't embed it might be in future uh, something related to another pro pro uh, research uh, that I am trying to develop. Uh, but right now, it wasn't for this specific work. wasn't embedded in a final element software. We just use um, MATLAB to interpolate the, the data. So in, in this case, we are really based on uh, uh, experimental data that we have. But probably we future work that is more related on uh, 3d printing because also in 3d printing specimen there is anisotropy especially for binder jetting that but that derived from other type of uh, uh are induced by other type of uh, phenomena uh and in that case my i might consider well, what we obviously not stream but that is more how the particles are arranged when you are layer by layer creating but yeah, it's something that we actually can do to try to avoid to do all this because I did it. It was part of my PhD thesis. So I have to do that and it takes a long time to take all those data. We also can do this in a more better tractable material, like using the IC. We can actually use that for example a phone mm -hmm. and then compress the phone and then keep track of using a micro IC. If you want to do the experiment. Mm -hmm. Generate the same database based on that. Okay, yeah, that could be a good, a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, so this was for uh, the, the particle, and this was for the radio of the force. Again, uh, for the radii along the x direction, we get, especially close to the green stage, so just compacted, we have larger. Uh, reading than on the other direction, but both of them in this case they are decreasing because you have shrinkage, so the pores tend to shrink. And plus, you can see at certain point the two ready they get similar because the pores tends to become more rounded. So it makes sense that these two points tend to at certain point kind of collapse in each other. So we get all this data and uh, we run the experiment, but first, as I mentioned, we try to measure experimentally our validation parameters, the dislocation density. One method we used at uh, that time was using the uh, nano indentation. So we indent locally our particles close to where we have the particle contact. And using this relationship, the uh, indentation size effect, uh, this uh, model actually correlates the, this nano Harman measurement with the dislocation density value. It uh, was developed by Nick and Gao. It's, it's a very old model, but it works. Obviously, is again dependent on the measure, strength of measurement. So you are taking account of large volume of, uh, of area. So this measurement can might be not super precise, but at least they give you give us some ideas of how much plastic deformity is the particle at this contact or at this other contact. The other experimental method we use was uh, use the ABSD uh, images um, that is electron backscattering diffraction that you can get from the CIM. The BSD what is provided to you is giving you the idea how the lattice structure inside your material have been deformed because uh, he gives you some um, degree of misorientation. And this misorientation 
uh, is a function of the dislocation. Specific one type of dislocation, the geometrically necessary dislocations that are those that are responsible of this deformation of the lattice of our material and correlate this mass with uh, the density, they obtain some of these maps of density dislocation. In this case, the other problem is that we are considering only this type of dislocation. And we are now considering this type of dislocation. So our measurement might be underestimated. So they were underestimated the type, the quantity of dislocation that we have in this material. But at least to have a rough estimation, they were uh, a good possibility. So here I represent all the measurement we have obtained for the dislocation density. The square I represent the uh, non-dislocation values. This uh, triangular shape, the ABSD, and the circle, the model. So, considering all the questions that could affect our um, our measurement, the BSD, we have an underestimation here, not super precise. The model pretty much follow roughly uh, what we have. Measure with the measurement, the measurement measure beside this A50. So, this A50 and come to the last slide might be uh, depends on the uh, evaluation of the diffusion coefficient uh, that is present in, in literature. So, the diffusion coefficient for the dislocation pipe diffusion are present up to roughly 750 uh, Celsius. All the data that you find in literature for higher temperature are just derived computationally or from some comparison with similar material. So there are some um, not uh, precise values uh, of that parameter. Um, that, uh, and this is an example, is from uh, this. Uh, article here, you can see this point here, this green line represents the diffusion coefficient for the type dislocation diffusion. And the experimental data ended here that is almost a 700 chances. So the rest of this plot and explaining this in this article have been derived by some computational uh, model and with the comparison with some other materials that have similar characteristics to either. So what we did, and um, actually this was done by Kenneth Vecchio in uh, UCSD and so on, but it is using our model to actually predict what is the diffusion coefficient for uh, the dislocation type diffusion. So this is what we obtained with our experimental data. And actually, um, is not present here. He conducts also some independent work by himself using this model. And he finds out that it actually works well to predict the dislocation density diffusion coefficient also for other, other tables. So that was just a brief overview of, the, of this work. Uh, that was my PhD work, although it's like a condensed. Uh, representation of three plus years of, of what I've done few years ago. Um, and if there are no any questions, I move to the second part that is trying to understand the gravity influence on the sintering of uh, uh, during the sintering of this center based additive manufacturing part. So uh, here I will do just a few overview of what we means for center based additive manufacturing. Uh, I will describe the two models for solid state sintering. So when you have, for example, the case of iron I just showed, where we sinter at that temperature, we have only diffusion but not liquid formation. And liquid phase sintering here is when you have more complex composition of your material and you have part of your material that map. For example, iron copper, the original temperature where the copper melts, 
And so you have iron that stays solid and uh, the copper that melts. And in this case, the presence of that small amount of liquid fees can enhance the, the densification because the diffusion in a liquid phase is much, much faster than a solid uh, phase. And also here, I will show some experimental uh, uh, tests we did uh, to validate our uh, model. So I will show also the result for the experimental model and compare them. And just at the end, how this, uh, we can use this model to provide some insight to design in case of additive manufacturing uh, to avoid to have this kind of uh, distortion due to uh, the gravity. So uh, the center uh, based additive manufacturing, at least the three main are bundle jetting, stereotography, and selective laser sintering. Um, here we have the ejection of binder, and layer by layer we create uh, our parts, spreading layers of powders. For the stereotography, we have a back with a slurry with a photo curing, uh, raising, and the particles of our material, and get a cure layer by layer from typically from the bottom, thanks to our laser. For the selective laser sintering, in this case, we directly sinter our material in the printer layer by layer, thanks to the heating that we could generate with the uh, so this case we are not considering for gravity because our part will get sintered directly here, so it's not subjected to, to the gravity. But the two uh, other two uh, technology, we obtain what we obtain uh, called green component that have to first the binder. We have to remove all the polymer that we use, and so consequently after we have to sinter. So in this process, if our part is like a sort of beam over and it might be subjected to this effect of the gravity it is not strong enough to uh, sustain that, uh, that action. So how we can model this process and also embed the, uh, the gravity, we again use the continuous mechanics theory of sintering where uh, the main situation that describes the behavior of our material during the sintering is present in this slide, where this sigma AJ represents the external stresses that are uh, applied to our part, gravity, in this case, but can be friction, if you have friction with the support, or if you apply external pressure, it can be also embedded here. Here is the um, effective uh, uh, stress of our model for uh, solid state uh, free sinking and solid state is considered this uh, parameter here, where mode zero is what we define as viscosity of uh, material. What we have in the bracket represents the resistance of our material during sinking and represents the resistance to. Uh, the deformation, the shear, and to the uh, shrinkage. Because here we have this uh, uh, C that represents the uh, normalized shear module, and this uh, C, uh, C that, that, uh, that oh, this <laughs> represents the normalized uh, bike model, where uh, theta. Here and here represent the porosity of our material. This last term here, PL, represents the sintering stress. So that driving force uh, that is function again of the radio of our particles and the surface energy that help us to densify our material. So for the liquid phase sintering, we have to modify because in this case we have two phases, solid and uh, liquid phase. So we have to embed the influence of these two uh, components. 
what we have to consider a little bit first is in the uh, density of our material. So in this case, we have to consider the fraction of the two phases, but also in uh, the viscosity here, that is not any more function of uh, the temperature, but now it's also function of how much of the solid and liquid phases have developed during the process. Plus, uh, last part, we have to consider the flux because uh, when we have this liquid, the solid particle that remains, they might be subjected to this sediment due to the gravity. So we have to consider the flux that induces this uh, variation of the composition of our material in the direction, if it's the vertical direction, due here. Uh, the concentration. So, if we have some inhomogeneity, our concentration can introduce some fluxes. Here, also variation of viscosity that can in induce uh, this movement of solid phase in the liquid phase. And here is the sediment, so the drive uh, influence uh, the drive from from gravity. So, with this main constitutive equation. Embedded in this case in a final method software, we can uh, describe how our material evolved and deformed during uh, the sinking process. Uh, but here, just show what have been done to validate the model is considering two different cases, two different technology and two different materials. One is uh, stainless steel 360L, where we have only solid state sintering. Here is with the stratigraphy, we print this uh, sort of uh, silica alumina uh, ceramic where uh, the silica uh, have a lower melting point, produce some liquid phase where uh, the alumina part is in a solid particle inside. So from that, we First, needed to understand the behavior again of the material during printing. So, we produce in this case this cylindrical specimen to do again a uh, dilatometry test. In this case, to extrapolate the what we call uh, viscosity of our material. So, we produce those little cylinder, we run the dilatometry test, and this is how our uh, plot looks like this blue dotted line represents the axial shrinkage, the red one represents the shrinkage rate. So, um, this is how it looks uh, between the two different materials and two different types of uh, structure. So, what we produce for again now, see how this part deformed due to the gravity. So we produce these little beams with increasing length, but keeping the same cross-sectional area. This part uh, was produced by a company that we collaborate specifically for this uh, type of problem. So they, because they, sorry, secret, we can, we can show the picture of the real component, but it looks like this. And also the results, uh, I don't have the picture of the real component. What I received from that is the 3D scan of the deformed part. So you will see a sort of um, image that mimic that uh, deformed part. Uh, meanwhile, this and this we produce in our, in our uh, lab. So we run those uh, sintering cycles that are presented there. And um, we'll see later how they are distorted. So from uh, the dilatometry test, and this is for the solid state sinking, we need to find how that part, that more zero, what we call viscosity, uh, ch uh, um, change with the temperature. So from this plot, we linearize that considering the relationship between the sintering stress and the viscosity is derived from the uh, main constitutive equation. So we linearize this relationship here, and by interpolation, 
we could get the value of A0 and also the activation energy Q that are the parameters that we need. Similarly, we did for the other case, the liquid phase injury. But in this case, uh, we have to consider that we can now get that linear relationship because here, when we have the formation of the liquid phase, we have a sudden change of the density. So here depends on only the solid state sintering. And here we notice this increasing of the viscosity is because uh, if you notice here, this right here, uh, represent how the solid state diffusion here close to this point kind of lose their energy. So it kind of slow down the diffusion mechanism. Uh, but when he hit the uh, temperature where the liquid, the first liquid is start to form, you have this sudden increase drop of the, the viscosity because the diffusion mechanism, again, in liquid is much, much faster than in the solid state diffusion. So we have this, and again, similarly, in this case, we didn't have a linear relationship on this equation here where we find the parameters for A, B, and C before and after the liquid formation. So knowing that, again, this is from the experimental data. You can see how the, these beams bend, the uh, function of the length. Also for the metallics, some of them, the longest one, are not present because they just crash, they, they just broken. But here is, uh, as I mentioned, the 3D scan of that part I showed at the beginning. This was, you can see how heavily distorted is for those things. So with the model, and by the infinite method, we get this distortion. So we predict this distortion. And I haven't had it in the slide, but I compare this profile with the experimental profile, and there are a good agreement between them. And similar we did for, for the stainless steel beads that you can see here. And also these were compared, and we got good agreement, agreement in the uh, experimental data. And this is the most complicated uh, parts. Um, and here is how um, this part has been distorted during the sintering with also the increase. This is the relative density that increased. So we, with the densification, we can see how these uh, parts have been uh, distorted during the, uh, during the process. So just to conclude, Analyzing our results and kind of get a more simplified relationship between porosity and all the uh, uh, parameters like uh, initial thickness, the initial length. We create this sort of uh, max. This was for the ceramic material where we can have the uh, here on the x axis, we have the what we call a normalized length, that is the length divided by the thickness. And here the deflection, so how much that a beam has been deflected. So these kind of maps, if you decide like to have a minimum uh, distortion, you can decide where it's allowable or it becomes too excessive based on the initial geometry of your of your part. And this was the uh, last slide of my uh, my presentation. And I uh, thank you for bringing us. Hopefully, I'll get All right. Uh, yeah. I just going to ask, what sort of uh, density density increase do you get with the centered the centered part versus the machine part? Of, you know, uh, so, is that the main reason for doing that? For centering, so. The main reason is you are not technically wasting material uh, because you know uh, 
you pre put the powder that you need. Technically, at least for 3D printing, depends. But for the like more classical uh, uniaxial compaction, uh, it, you design your part to not be machined. What you get is what you want to use, unless to refine something. So you are minimizing the, the waste of material. And um, even you have some residual porosity, you tend to reach close to 99%. You have some residual porosity, but it doesn't uh, affect the mechanical properties of too much of your material. And actually, in, uh, in the automotive, that technology is used for produce component, for example, for automotive companies, if you have some porosity inside your material, your component is likely, it's a little bit lighter. So it might be also useful that you don't have a heavy part. So he, he, you gain heavy. You said it's 90%. Like now you tend to get between 90, 99, 98%. Depends on the application. It's not much. Yeah. There, uh, yeah. Uh, but you know, with the compaction in a die, you might design your parts in a certain way that with just the machine you cannot achieve having more like different structure, remove some material. And with 3D printing, actually, they are trying to get even better results. There are all those research to other space create a lot of parts now that are on Boeing or they do classical like uh, print that you're taking are actually 3D printed because they are maximizing the mechanical property, minimizing the amount of material that you are using. So they are even more lighter and a lighter uh, airplane consume less gas. That is good for the uh, company. And that is the main actually application for additive manufacturing right now because are expensive, the 3D printed part, but for companies that produce our play, that cost is worth it for, for the application they, they are using. Okay, uh, I would just ask for more questions. You can ask Dr. Torres on the or you can go to Rekha and ask her more questions as well. Uh, thank you all for coming. Yeah.